Well, we continue on. And this one won't be quite as much of an odyssey as the last ones. We've chewed out or we've rough hewn the large figure of things and now we can go at a little bit slower pace and we don't have to be quite so uh, trying to say everything all in one talk. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take advantage of the Christmas season. We're trying to draw closer to the Christ and in that advance our spiritual lives. And what we're trying to do over these 12 days is to look at different aspects of Christ and Christian mysticism. And we have taken as a starting point the uh, nativity story. And we started talking, the first talk we've talked about the nativity as a singular event and as a cosmic horoscope for the earth and the Christified earth for now and for the second half of the whole evolutionary creation. Then we, for the next two talks, we looked at the uh, people in the story. We looked at Jesus, we looked at Christ, we looked at Jesus Christ, and finally we ended up talking about that divine cosmic being, composite being, Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to take little steps now, and today we're going to talk about the, uh, the central act in the Christmas story, birth. And we'll start very, very simply, and we'll work our way in as far as we can go. It will take, again, most 90% of the talk to get to the subject matter that we're trying to get to. But if we just take a very mundane outlook about birth, and uh, we know that birth, though it comes of a sudden, is something that has a really long, long preparatory period. The whole gestation is a great period of anticipation. There's an expectancy. We are pregnant with curiosity and with hope as much as the mother is pregnant with the baby. There is a dramatic moment. When the child is born, it's a very dramatic moment. The best I can ever, uh, the best story of it uh, that I've ever seen is from, uh, you know, no matter what you expect it, it's going to be like, it's always more wonderful that, than that. But Dostoevsky, in his novel, The Possessed, has something about birth in there that is astounding. In the possessed, there is a cell of people that are pre-revolutionary revolutionaries, and this is sort of a vain group, and all they want to do is overturn the old ways. They don't really have uh, something to replace it with. That's often what it is with revolutionaries. And they're up to making all kinds of trouble, and for all of this trouble, they want to have a fall guy. They had this man called Shatov, who will be the fall guy for them. And Shatov is most interesting, because he touches on something we're going to talk about later on, freedom. But Shatov believes the only free act that a human being can do is to commit suicide. Because if you do that, you're going against all the natural instincts, you're going against all of the... Uh, teachings of religions, and that the only way you can be free is to be above natural and human law. And so he figures the only thing that one can do to become free is to commit suicide. And so he's going to write a note and take complete responsibility for everything that this little cell of revolutionaries does, and uh, then he's going to commit suicide. But suddenly, his wife gives birth to a child. And he said, first there was one life, and now there are two lives. And his, just in seeing the change of something new come to birth like that, his consciousness is so completely changed that, uh, changed that he uh, 
reneges on his vow to commit suicide for the cell. And it is, it, uh, I probably should have brought a copy of it along. It's really one of the most beautiful passages in literature. I know I should probably, being a mystical student, I should probably like Tolstoy better than Dostoevsky, but uh, for all of his sin, I love Dostoevsky a lot because he cared about people. So then birth is a very dramatic moment. In fact, we know from a spiritual point of view that birth is so dramatic that the sensitivity inherent in the entity that is being born is so great that that first breath carries the character or stamps the character from the past life into the individual so that they're completely in harmony with the cosmos through their horoscope. So it's, it's a rather dramatic time. And there's often in birth for both the mother and for the infant, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of suffering. But when the child is born, it's so helpless and it's so beautiful and it's complete. Everything that it needs, it's not all developed yet, but everything that it needs is there. And everybody wants to hold it. And everybody wants to love it. You know, and our little group in Madison, we're starting to have more babies now. I don't know, do any, any folks here know Alma Hinsky? Very quiet young man that traveled here a few years ago. He and his wife are uh, uh, having a baby next spring, and uh, we'll be the second in our group now. We have a little special prayer group. We get together once a week, and at least for the prayers and uh, the other things as well. And then there is that long period of development after the birth. We'll come back to that again. It's something that is alluded to in the cosmic conception as birth being actually fourfold. Now, Max Engel has interesting things to say about birth. And most especially, he has interesting things to say about birth in the funeral service. And uh, almost everybody has interesting things to say about, uh, about birth, but they represent, birth and death represent great moments, very great moments in life. Some people, like the Tibetan Buddhists, for example, believe that at the moment of death is the time that one is closer to God than at any other time. When the spinning forward stops and the unspinning backward has not yet begun, in that stillness, one can be closer to God. And I think there's quite a bit to that. And birth itself is not a birth into greater light, it's a birth into greater darkness. Because for the most part, whether we realize it or not, we're living most of our life here in blind faith. We learn very important lessons here. We learn lessons of limitation, because if we can't learn to live with limitation, uh, we could be very great dangers to ourselves, you know, very great harm to ourselves in the inner worlds without being able to understand limitation. And we learn objectivity here. We may be able to look from only one point of view at a person, but it's not like looking from the desire world where you can look from all points of view at the same time, but we develop an objectivity. We learn to measure, we learn to judge, so that when we have that impregnated into our consciousness, then when we pass into the spiritual worlds, they won't be subjective the way they were in the past when we were guided, we'll have the objectivity that we learn here through science and art and all the other disciplines that we grow by, we will be able to carry that into the spiritual world. This is why this is our training school. But the uh, Platonists had a very unusual view about birth, which is echoed in our funeral service. The Platonists believed that birth was a death, and that this was the underworld that was ruled by Pluto, and that all of the other spiritual worlds were the real worlds. You know, we've got it sort of backwards now in some ways, where he said, this come back to the real world, and we mean this is the real world. We'll, when we're closer to God, that's really more of the real world. Uh, but we don't, we don't want to talk about things like that too much. In fact, the Platonists, even, you know what the Platonists called the body? They called it the sarcophagus. They said that, you know, this, this is our body of death. 
and they celebrated when somebody died. The point I'm trying to reach in a very elementary way is that moments like birth and like death are special turning points. Every moment is a birth of some kind and a death of another kind. When we're born into this world, we die to the inner world consciousness. Or when we die from this world, we're born back into the spiritual worlds. So we see that there are, every moment is a moment, but there are special moments. Like in geometry, we can say that there's a, an infinite number of triangles, and some of them are very small, but some of the triangles are special cases. You learn about them in trigonometry, the equilateral triangle, 30-60-90 triangle, the isosceles right triangle. Those are special cases, special cases where we come to a very clear understanding of the nature of triangulation. You know, that we understand that idea more clearly in the special cases. And day by day, there are special cases, there are special moments, sunrise and sunset. You know, if you've ever camped out, and it's nice and warm while the sun is on you, but suddenly in one moment's time, the sun is gone and you're cold. And no matter what side you put to the campfire, the other side is cold. And so the sunrise and sunset are a special moment. The moment we're looking at now is the moment of birth and death. And we're saying that that's the same moment because the death of the future is the birth of the present. Or the death of the present is the birth of the past. So each and every moment is a it is, is a birth or a death. Now we want to look at a very special birth moment, and that is the birth in and of Christ. Max Heindel uses and uses very frequently the poem by Angela Silesius that reads, Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, and not within thyself, thy soul will be forlorn. The cross to Golgotha thou lookest to in vain, unless within thyself it be set up again. And that's what we're trying to look to, the birth of Christ. Now, if we want to be biblical Christians, since most people here are familiar with the Bible and base quite a bit of their Christianity on that, in John's Gospel, the birth in Christ is talked about probably the best in the story of Nicodemus. When Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, which means uh, probably means out of the body, because the St. John's Gospel is a very esoteric uh, gospel. This is what Jesus says to him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Or as later on he says, Verily, verily, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then further on he says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. That's a pretty clear statement. And that's what we're going to try and understand and in an intellectual way as much as possible experience. Now that view of a second birth is not unique to Christianity. In the ancient world, especially among the Greeks, the Egyptians, and everyone else felt that same way. In fact, even in the most primitive societies, the initiate was always called a twice-born. And the twice-born was always a remarkable individual. It was someone who had gone through an extremely difficult circumstance 
and in going through that was reborn. And not only reborn, but reformed so that the individuals were always very, very remarkable in their consciousness, but especially in their morality, in their willingness to love and help others. So this is something that is not sectarian to Christianity. It's Christianity, or the way we're looking at it, is an outlook at the universal truth. It just happens that uh, in the being of Christ Jesus, we have the central focus of that truth. So, what we're looking at then is awakening in spiritual consciousness. But we're actually looking at more than a second birth. We're looking at a second and a third birth. If you want the uh, biblical, it's a little more obscure, but Christ says he gives us the comforter. And so there is one state that is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a birth into the consciousness of self. That is a birth into the human spirit. And there is a second birth, which we're ultimately trying to get to, and that is birth in Christ. That is referred to in a very unique way in the Gospels. That is referred to by John and almost only by John. The Christian mystic initiation is referred to as the disciple who Jesus loved. That loving that comes from the life spirit, that is a shorthand for the Christian mystic initiation. The disciple who Jesus loved means that loving was the initiation. So what we're talking about in Rosicrucian terms then are two levels of spiritual birth, which from here on we will call the fifth and sixth birth because for the Rosicrucian students we already have four levels of birth, which we'll come to in a little bit. So we're not, what we're talking, we're not just being technical. We're not, uh, we're not just trying to uh, be technical and talk about higher births. We're trying to talk about something that is necessary and that is within our being. Ultimately, we must come, must become beings that are born again and again. Not merely in the physical sense, but in a higher sense. If you want the technical, fancy term for this, a continuous and progressively deeper spiritual rebirth is called palingenesis. So we've got, you know, you're going to go home and press all of your friends now and say that you know the difference between parthenogenesis and palingenesis. And it'll get you a little mileage, but it won't do as much as the way you live your life. Uh, you have to live something in order for it to work out. Now the process that we're talking about as spiritual birth is an extremely slow process. Extremely slow. In fact, there is a statement that goes among all of the mystery traditions that slow is fast. If you try to leap and make a lurch effort, it's going to be sure trouble. We know from the Rosicrucian teaching that even the germs of the threefold spirit were each preceded by an exceedingly long period of experience. That is a cosmological law. Experience comes first. Spiritual potential comes later. We know that, for example, we went through the Saturn period as being formed into all, very much like the way we build buildings or uh, the way we make machines or things like that. We went through all of the experience of form where we're in our resistance, we provided the stuff for stable form for what are now the lords of the mind. And after we had learned the experience of resistance to produce form, only then could we have the germ of will planted in us. 
It's as if to say that we had to have the experience first and then the will later. We had to have resistance to the divine will and in that, out of that, you know, it's, it's really beautiful the way the whole cosmo, how the whole cosmos works. That even in our deepest state of ignorance, when we're uh, when we're resisting the whole creation, we're still serving it, and it fits in in a very valuable, helpful way to the whole uh, of of the cosmos. Okay, I promised myself I wouldn't get my, lose my notes today, and I try to stay the way, the way it is. Even in uh, The development of the spirit before we can be born into the self and before we can be born into the Christ we have to develop them and we develop them through our personality if we are not thoroughly developed physical etheric emotional and mental personalities, if we haven't a, a, a very good development in each of those things, if we're not well-rounded, if we're not balanced, we have nothing to build or gestate the spiritual qualities with. Now, this is a really important thing. This is, uh, it's quite an important thing. It uh, uh, differentiates our teaching from many of the ancient teachings in that the ancient teachings think all you have to do is awake to the spiritual realms whereas in the modern evolutionary Rosicrucian teaching we know that one feeds the spirit and the spirit grows and develops from the experience in these phenomenal realms and it isn't just a matter of awakening awakening is part of it and what we awaken to is perfect but because something is perfect doesn't mean it's done yet you know, that perfection is something that carries on and on and on. So we're going to be talking now a little bit about development. In the last talk of this whole series on soul growth, we're going to talk more about it, and uh, we'll go into it much more thoroughly then. So what we're going to say is before we can awaken to self, we have to have developed that self, and it has to have sort of become strong in itself. All right, so we have to ask ourselves what it means to develop in terms of a self and uh, have the experience of birth. In that second very laborious talk that we went through on the Christ, we said that that the self or the spiritual ego, the higher self, is an idea. It is a divine idea immaculately conceived by the divine will and the divine imagination. It is an idea that has all of the precision of an abstract thought, as in mathematics and it has all of the fluidity and holiness and creativity of spirit. All right, we've got that far in the past. Now, what we did in those talks was we produced a rather skeletal view of the self. The self is more than that, it has character. And in the interaction, with the fourfold personality, it develops character. It develops an individuality. It develops sort of like a color to it. And that's what we're talking about. We're saying that uh, this is born from the kinds of experiences we have here. I had a wonderful experience this last summer. I was, I was able to spend a number of days going hiking through national parks in the southwest. And I saw things, and you get way back in there and you see things like, wow, this is you know, uh, just amazing. And I had something like, I actually laid in a, in a stream, in a mountain stream, with just my head above the water, and saw the little hummingbirds come four feet away from my head, they came and they dipped in and they drank water. And 
I was just standing, I was just boggling kind of thing. But, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that from our experiences, from our emotional experiences, our artistic work, from our scientific understanding, and from the impacts of the material world, the self develops character. And our bodies, all four of our bodies, are our creative work. Now, you know, I'm saying a big thing because I'm a very sick body. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm saying that, uh oh, there are quite a few errors in uh, creative work along the way. But it is through this that the uh, character or the self of the self is developed. We also said in that talk on birth that in the process of thinking, especially deeply concentrated thinking, the spirit developed will, general will. It developed the ability to command the fourfold body through the mind. And we said that in the deepest kind of concentration, it transcended and we had the awakening to the self in a transcendent experience that from our concentrations, the natural product is that we understand the thinker through the process of thinking, because we cannot do the concentrated work without watching ourselves as we do the thinking. And we talked about that principle of transcendence. I know this doesn't sound anything like what we said when we said it originally, but that's all right here. That's, that's the importance of, uh, you know, we should be having somebody up here doing this like this every week of the year. We got the place, we might just want to have it open and open to the public. And we've got a lot of talent in the organization. Uh, some of them need this fellowship, but I'm sure they'd come back if they, uh, you know, we all love each other and we're married to each other. And when you're married to somebody, you know, you're asleep in the same bed, you can't go to bed angry. You've got to come back and you got to, you know. I've had great success that way with my brother. All of my life, I thought my brother would never, ever try to ever understand me, just pick out some skill, some weird old quick speech neck or something that would never listen to me. And do you know now, after 20 some years, he finally had a conversation that he listened to me, and he felt really before I wanted to kiss him. Because for once, you know, I've listened to him intently for years, and I get the first sentence out of my mouth and turn his head and walk away. And he never listened to me, you know, like, you know, but, you know, for life, I wish you, you know, we should be looking at this from different points of view and teaching, and teaching our lives and growing uh, all the time. You know, we should be open all the way. All right, but back on the, uh, experience, uh, on the uh, topic, even though we said that we awaken to the self by transcending or discovering the self, as the thinker, we don't mean to say that the process of spiritual awakening is only a thinking process. That the process of becoming is only thinking. If that were the case, we'd have only a mind. But the self is within and behind everything we do. We mentioned the other day that we really don't know ourselves that we're not aware of the unconscious functioning of self in the physical body, those the miraculous things all of the time, and we're not even aware of it in our psyche, in the uh, subconscious part of our auric existence, because we have all of these unconscious activities, subconscious activities going on. But the spirit really is in all of these things, and through all of the aspects, all of the attributes of the spirit, of the personality, the spirit becomes. In doing all of this, what we are, or what we become in spirit, is what we have done. We are a product of what we have done and what we have not done. We become the essence of our experience. In fact, from a spiritual point of view, it's probably much better to live a life of less sin than to live a, a, a fetish life where we do nothing, to sit around and do nothing. 
be much better to get out and experience all kinds of things and do all kinds of things, even if it meant all kinds of painful retribution, even if it meant all kinds of uh, uncomfortable circumstances for others, it's much better that we do and experience than just sit and do nothing. It's still all going to be plenty to do anyway. So we develop through this a color and a flavor. So let's quickly review everything that we've looked at. First and foremost is that self or spiritual ego is immaculately conceived as an idea and that it has a discrete identification of itself. In fact, that's what self is. It's the knower. It's more than just the thinker. It's the knower. The whole process of uh, seeing the world is identifying, and that's what the spirit does, in the same way that there was being before there was a threefold and it became a being, the spirit identified itself through selfhood. It became a being. And that process of individuation in spirit is mirrored in the personality and in the cosmos by understanding the things of the world, by identifying them and saying this is true, that is true, that process of identification, it's, it's sort of like having a new brain in the animals, or, you know, being able to, you know, children go through this stage where they identify this thing and that thing and that thing, and that's a part of becoming. It's a part of knowing that self is in this, and that's what this is in with, with self. All right. So self is an immaculately conceived idea. It is the focus, the primary focus of the threefold spirit. And as such, it's capable of creating other ideas, and it's capable of creating period. It is a divine being. It's capable then of concluding things and concluding the meaning or the intention the purpose behind things. Because that's what we know when we come to ourselves. We say, ah, that's what it means. We've got the idea, the truth of it. It's capable through the personality of manifesting thoughts and other phenomenal concretions through those thoughts. And through its relations with its personality, it gleams out experiences in growth. It is a great experiment. It is a great creation that trying and going into the unknown and creating something new. You know, you get filled, you get a, a creative idea, and you're filled and you try to create it, and it never comes out that you want it to. But in the process, the wonderful experience comes back to you and the spirit becomes stronger. So what we are is what we have and what we have not done. And eventually, this process isn't so much unconscious, but we become more and more aware until we have that moment where we discover our essential nature as God. And then in that moment, we can say, just like Rene Descartes, or just like Jehovah in the Old Testament, or just like Popeye the Sailor Man. I am that I am. And when you can say that, it doesn't hurt anybody else, and it, it's, it's a cosmic revelation to yourself. You say, I am. And, and you know it. You're awake. All right. And at the same time, you can say, God is. All right, we've got a little bit of the uh, beginning preparatory thought out of the way. The reason we began talking about material pregnancy and gestation is because there is a gestation or parturition of the self. And just like the regular material gestation, it's a long, long building process. We build through everything we do. Everything we do is food for the spirit. And we cannot, as spirit, if 
it's, it, we have to confirm ourselves in some ways from not being too much in life. I don't know how to say what I want to say. Everything that we experience in life, every last thing that we experience is saved. Nothing is discarded. When we get into those pictures in the ethers, there are things there that in the moment when we first experience them, we will not even recognize they were there. Now, if God is anything, God is not wasteful. Ultimately, parsimonious. What is it? Occam's razor to Spain to do with more, we can be done with less. Uh, this, I believe, means that every moment of our life, every experience, everything that we go through is important. God is in it. And in the experience of that and the re-experience, this is why it takes such a long time after we die because we have to digest this. And we have to make it part of us and we have to understand the essence of all of our experience such that even the most trivial thing. I had one five minute cab ride in Mexico City over 30 years ago that in just this last year I discovered the meaning of it. I won't go into it because it's too much of a side trip to what we're doing. But it was a hair raising cab, uh, cab ride because that, that cab driver, I thought he had wheels that went perfectly sideways. He went in and out of the traffic. And uh, I was, it was, it, it <laughs> I was glad. I, glad to get to the railroad car because I knew the railroad car was going to stay on the tracks. Uh, but uh, And it took me 30 years and then finally I discovered what that meant and what it meant about my character and how my character would have to be less uh, provincial and less parochial. And it, was, it was a big embarrassment, but just five minutes like that had, and 30 years later. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a very, very slow gestatory period. Now, if we are really intent on this, if we're really hungry for life, the same expectancy that we have for the birth of an infant, you know, everybody's picking out names for it ahead of time, and whether, whether it's going to be a boy or whether it's going to be a girl, that same attitude should also mount in us in the spiritual gestation. And that is an attitude that I think should pervade all spiritual seeking. And the best description of it is in that lovely novel, which is hard to read and hard to understand what is behind it, but it's beautiful. It's by Edward bulwer lytton It's called Zanoni. And Zanoni, the, the, the Zanoni is called A Treatise on Enthusiasm. And it was by enthusiasm that all of the initiations were accomplished. And it is by enthusiasm that we have that expectancy and that glow and that fervor in the spiritual life. We're longing for light, more light. So it, it's something of that nature. And we usually don't know what the baby is going to be like. We don't know if it's going to be a boy or a girl or it's going to be lonely or ugly. I was told that I was born with my ears flapped away over my head and the doctor turned to my father and said, well, you always wanted a coon out. <laughs> uh, so, but it's the same as true of the spirit. Every now and then we get glimpses, but less we in our lower selves get vain. We daren't look at the bride before the wedding. But we know occasionally wondrous things come to us and when they come to us we say that had to be from God that couldn't possibly have been from me and if we're so caught in our personality that's the way we see the, the uh, true self in us it is really divine it is God and if we, we discover oh my God, that's what I am uh, it would you know so we have things like what Paul says and Paul says it's probably the best it's not certain what we're going to be like but whatever it is, it's going to be a little lower than the angels. And whatever it is that we're going to be like, we'll be like him. And that, I think, is about as beautiful as it can be. We also know that uh, 
because of our hubris, because we've taken as much pride as we have in this complex pseudo ego with the small e that we have, we know that before we can be humble, we're going to have to go through the pains of delivery. And uh, we're going to have to be mother to ourselves as much as self is mother to us. Because all the more so then, our life, it's, it's one of those ironies, one of those paradoxes of spiritual living, that we will be less free than before in some ways. Because a mother, when she has a baby, her life isn't her own anymore. She has to take care of that baby. And when we are birthed in the self, when we are born in the spirit, our life isn't ours anymore. We live it if we live for God's sake. Or those words that we hear only nowadays in profanity, we live for Christ's sake. Okay. So the we come eventually then to a moment of birth. We could carry on these analogies to pregnancy on and on and on. And I give long talks, but I don't want to be tedious. And so we'll just sort of leave it off there. And other people, you know, other people want to have their shot too, you know. It's, it's nice. I don't want to, I, would, I don't want, really want anybody to discover everything for me. I would just as soon sit and listen and hear somebody else discover. So I won't carry on like this. So it all leads up to the moment, the moment of birth, the culmination. And there is a tension, just like there is a tension in the giving of birth. Every uh, awakening to self, the ultimate eureka, there's always been a tension in the personality, always been a struggle, and then suddenly there is the awakening and we awaken to the ultimate Eureka, and we belong. We're part of the divine family. We're born to the divine mother, the divine father, and we belong in a way that we never have before, because as long as we're in this personality, and we're so differentiated, and there's so much separation, and there's so much selfishness, it's never like when we are accepted into the divine cosmic family, and we belong and we can say, I'm home. That's, that's sort of like the uh, discovery. We look a little bit now at, this, at the fifth birth. Now we have to look a little bit at the sixth birth. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to birth in Christ. It's hard to do the days for me here are getting harder and harder because I'm talking about more and more holy things. And uh, as we said in an earlier talk, that when you talk about holy things, you expose yourself to the love. And that is always a humiliating experience because we are filled with all kinds of uh, sins. In fact, where very often when we enter on the whole spiritual path, we enter on the spiritual path for very selfish reasons. I had a treasure that I lent to somebody and I never got back, and I know of only one person in the world who can put their finger on it for certain. And it is the famous or infamous letter of Max Heindel to C.W. Ledbetter. And this is shortly after he came into the spiritual path. He tells the story to Ledbetter of how he came to first talk on clairvoyance because he wanted to unfold clairvoyance so that he could know people's secrets because if he knew people's secrets, he could take advantage of them better. And he said, I came as a, I was a smoker and a drinker and a luster after flesh. 
and he said, I tried to skip the next lecture, which was on karma by Mrs. Desant, and uh, I got the days mixed up, and I sat through that lecture, and I left a different man. And he said, thanks to you, I now realize I can control my own thoughts. And I'm not just a worm in the dirt that is subject. And it's thanks to you, there's hope that I can be free from all of this. It's, it was a most beautiful letter. Uh, it's a little bit shocking to, uh, you know, every time saints confess their sins, it's shocking to people who would like to think that their sins are perfect. But it was... Uh, yeah, it made me feel that I was associated with somebody who was a human being. And somebody who was a human being who took very, very great steps. You know, there's still another artifact around. There is one of the first book that Max Heinle ever wrote. I think the Boris still publishes it. It's called uh, Madame Blavatsky and the Secret Doctrine by Max Heinle. And if you read that, and then you read the Cosmo Conception and all of the other things, if that isn't enough, convert you to those who can teach me. I don't know what is. Because if that man changed from that kind of consciousness to that kind of consciousness, the initiation certainly is a profound character to be experienced. But at any rate, we have to face the love that burns like coals on our foreheads. And we have to uh, look exactly in the eyes we figured that with with three tapes we ought to at least get one out of the <laughs> one good one out of the out of the batch. So when we when we can face Christ and say I am weak, you know, pain or shame or things like that rise an awfully strong uh, prayer. But when you think about it. You know, there are times early in the path that we think we could go back, but now we know we can't. We just can't go back and immerse ourselves in our sins and sorrows. And we can't claw out our wounds to make them hurt. We just got to go forward. Especially since the clock is running, we have to go forward, and I don't want to waste people's time. So we pick ourselves up and move on. Move on. When we first spoke about coming into ourselves or being born in the self, in which we're now calling the fifth birth, we said Christ left us the Comforter and that he had to leave because he couldn't stay. Meaning to say, until we had developed strength in ourselves, we couldn't be born in Christ so that everything we've just now been saying that we have to feed and build the self before we can awaken it is also true and probably true in spades relative to Christ. That we have to grow in that, in ourself and in Christ before we can awaken to it. Now in that talk we said that the relationship of the human spirit, the self, to the life spirit was the relationship of self to selfness. It was the idea or the universal that contained within it all of the other ideas or universals. In a way then, the being that represents it, there is a name for it, that is the Christ that incarnated and incarnates into our earth, in a way we can say that is a self of selves. In fact, uh, we're gonna, in some of the later talks, we're going to talk about that there is like the Father or the Divine Spirit represents meaning. The sun, or life spirit, represents words. Whereas when it becomes a being, 
And when it becomes an individuality, in the Holy Spirit, it becomes a name. But some, in some ways, looking at the human spirit relative to the life spirit, it is like saying that the being that represents the life spirit out of which all of the individualities are born, that stuff of altruism, you can call that, as the Gnostics called it, several hundred years before Christ, uh, they called it the name above all names. Paul, who was very familiar uh, with the Gnostic traditions, used it in his own writing, call, calling it the name above all names. Okay, now we're going to try and look, in, look and try to be a little bit more intimate and familiar with Christ. Obviously, we can't do it in a talk like this because it's all outward and you know we're working together and we're thinking together but for the most part the coming close to Christ has to come on our own now we said at that time that the experience of self and the experience of Christ happen simultaneously that when we discover an idea or when we ideate and form an idea, and especially if that happens to be the idea of self as God, the lights go on. And we said that Christ was the light of pure truth. It was the living truth that is in the highest of all of our ideas. Now we said that the discovery of the self and the truth of which the self is part was simultaneous. Now that is not unique. That is the general way of things in the spiritual worlds. In the spiritual worlds, the discovery, anytime one part of the spirit is known, all parts of the spirit is known. If for those of you that are interested in biblical Christianity, it's said in a number of ways, uh, mostly in John's Gospel, which is by far the most metaphysical of the Gospels. Uh, Christ, speaking to the individuality of the Apostle, says, I am in you, and you are in me. In another place, to know me is to know the Father. Or he says, I and the Father are one. It is not... A, uh, when we speak of the idea of trinity in unity and unity in trinity, those are not so many words. There is, in the transcendental realms, a unity that is much greater and that the character of the three, each member of the threefold spirit is more attributive. It's an attribute of a one rather than a separation of a one. So as a consequence, everything that we experience in the spirit is universal. So that uh, we can't know one part of the spirit without knowing the other. In fact, even the, the synoptic representatives, the living delegates of the divine spirit, the life spirit, and the human spirit, that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all three of those beings which are the living representatives act together in union. It's nothing separate. It's, you know, ah, be a relief, you know, that you can be yourself with, with others without the least amount of uh, personal tension. And the funny thing is, is uh, we, we get terribly defensive in our personalities and we feel that we have to de defend and make sure we keep our personalities separate rather than... Uh, uh, in the realms of pure spirit, we can be ourselves and in no way is anything lost and only enforced by the interaction with others. I, I don't know how to say it. It's not in the notes, but... Uh... Now, the things of the spirit are different from the phenomenal realms in another way. The things of the spirit are creative whereas the things in the phenomenal realms are, according to the ancient mysteries, fabricating. That in the 
phenomenal worlds we build by fabrication, by separating, building things that way. Whereas things in the realm of spirit are brought by unifying and bringing more and more things together and creating in that way. Probably the most uh, clear example of this is in the way our bodies develop, in the way our bodies grow, and the way they heal. And the, the best example I can think of is the egg, a chicken's egg. You know that starts, that's one cell, that an ostrich egg is the biggest single cell in the world. And do you know what happens when a chicken is born? That cell separates in half, and it separates again, and it divides again and again, and it divides in quality, so such that little claws and beaks and feathers and guts and everything come out. It's, a, it's an entirely a process of separation. The separative fabricating process, you know, like we take ore out of the ground and we separate and separate until we purify something and we build by putting separates together. In the spiritual realms, we unify. And thus, in a way, when we know ourselves and when we have the birth of the self or in the self, we also have a birth in Christ. And this birth is a very, very slow process. This birth in Christ was called by the ancients being a thrice born because it wasn't uh, unknown of in, the inter in the previous times. Uh, the classic example is thrice born, thrice greatest Hermes. So we have uh, the sixth birth relative to, to all. Now, we're gonna, in order to look at this birth in Christ, I'm again, I believe, in the way that the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception was written, that it starts out and it goes through the same things and it spirals through them again and again, so we have to go all the way back again and loop back this time as far as the way the self is born. It is slowly, step by step, it comes through the personality. In the first birth, the physical is born, and the self, though it's not awake, is totally identified with the physical. You take a little kid, three years old, it falls down and hurts itself, and it's got an owie, and itself is hurt. Its whole life is in its body. Then you take a kid that's between seven and puberty, and that kid identifies itself with its energy. You know, like, look at how fast I can run, or look at how long I can do this, or look at how I'm growing. The self is identified through action. You don't have to listen to teenage records for long to know that the self of the uh, post-puberty uh, person is romantic. It's all in the desire world. And boy, if you ever criticize the music that a teenager likes, you have hurt their self because their feelings are all tied up you know, the self is all tied up with the feelings. And then we come to where most people are lost. They're all bound up in their thinking. If you, if you speak against somebody else's argument, I live in, in a university community, and I have to deal with the people who have everything invested in their minds. And because they got so much invested in their minds, they can't get beyond that to their true self. And if you attack their argument, or if you attack their line of thought, you have attacked them. You know how it's like when you're in your 20s and you go through college and every day it's a whole, you know, you discover yourself on a whole new philosophy and you want to run off and say, I've got, the, I've got the truth now. And then finally we come to the fifth birth, the birth of self, and I think we're ready to uh, talk about birth of the self and birth of the Christ. Now, in doing that, we're going to do something that is slightly dangerous we're going to use an image to uh, talk about the birth of self. Because we're going to look at this from a different point of view. And any time that you make an image, there's always the tendency to think that the image is the truth rather than the bearer of the truth. Uh, men especially are subject to that. 
uh, they tend to think that a woman's body is the woman and not the spirit within. It's, this is a thing that I'm really glad that things came out of the Anita Hill trial or the Clarence Thomas uh, Anita Hill matter because it sensitized a lot of people to the way women feel about that kind of objectification of their physical image. In this case, it's especially tricky and especially dangerous because the image we're going to use is a natural image more than it is an artificial image. And it's a universal image that we've all seen from time to time, see it regularly. And uh, we're only going to look at it in the most simple elementary way. Uh, as usual, we don't have time to do much of anything. We, you know, we're uh, painting in broad strokes. How does it say there's a divinity that shapes our lives, rough hew them as we may? Uh, Hamlet's is all those beautiful ones. Uh, this, we have a great biased view living where we do. Because this image that we see is only found, is found everywhere, but in the realm we spend most of our consciousness and the very deepest of the spiritual world. You know how biased we are? We're in the chemical region the solid region of the dense physical plane and that's unlike all the rest of the universe. We have a really biased view of reality. I don't know how to say that any other way. The limitations are important for us to grow by but all of the other realms are fluidic. All of the other realms flow into each other. You can't imagine uh, you couldn't imagine a desire being shaped like this and having this kind of permanent... You know what, a, what it's like to have a feeling? A feeling is much more subtle and its shape is, is, is different. It's not, it's not a hard, crusty thing. Well, everything in the fluidic realms is different than in the solid realms. I'll just, just take a look. You know, everything, most, most everything here is opaque. And most, most everything here is to us grossly impenetrable. But even with just one step up, diving in the water, look at a fish. Look at the agility that a fish has or the agility that a bird has and the experience of water or air to say nothing of the spiritual world. There's an enormous, enormous difference. Now there is a common form that occurs in the fluids. It's associated with things that are, happen in uh, fluid mechanics and all that kind of stuff. It's a simple thing. It's a swirl or an eddy or a whirlpool. Everybody has seen them. I spent a lot of time as a child looking at little trout streams and I saw lots of swirls and see all the little flotsam come into little balls inside the swirls and such like that. That is one of... that. Formally, that is called a vortical spiral or a spiral vortex. It's probably the most universal of all forms in the fluidic realms. The way we normally see it, we see it in a wrong way. Uh, at least the way we see it in the material world is different than the way it appears in the spiritual world. We see it by producing a disturbance. Like if you pull an oar, for example, through the water, you see the uh, whirlpool form behind it. In the spiritual world, it's different. That there is, it is an internal force that starts the spinning and that produces the vortex and that produces the sucking quality of the vortex. In fact, uh, some spiritual seers describe it exactly the way the uh, uh, experiment is shown in the cosmic conception. Some seers claim that the solar system is like in the ethers, the planetary spirits, by their concentration, produce these huge, big sucking vortices and then the solidified matter balls up inside of those vortices and that's what the planets are. 
and that really that you know that that it is an internal con uh, you know that it is an internal focus of the uh, planetary spirit that produces the vortex and it isn't that the production of a planet you know do you remember the example that Heinel gives in the cosmo conception of taking a round wash tub and filling it with water and then putting oil on the top and then starting it spinning then at various places there would vortexes form and then the planets form like balls inside of the vortexes uh, that kind of experience that's what I'm, I'm just trying to point out uh, nothing profound I'm just trying to say that this figure of the vortical spiral is universal through all the fluids. Uh, Max Seindel and other clairvoyants say that the etheric form of the atom is a spiral vortex. And some uh, people go further and say that even the little things that we call particles are little vortices, tight little vortices in the, uh, in the ethers. Now, it's much more complex than that because in one way, if we ha all had the clairvoyance and could look very close, all of the atoms of our body and all of the molecules of our body would be seen as vortices. But over that, in our spiritual consciousness, we marshal them all together and we produce forms like this. We superimpose or we uh, marshal together. But the fundamental basic form in the fluid is a spiral vortex. Okay, I think I've, I don't want to belabor the point. Now, the point that I want to make at this point is, it may sound preposterous, but the basic form of the self or of the human spirit is a spiral vortex. Now, that's just a form. The life, as we said before, is a spiritual idea, and a spiritual idea that is capable of creating. But the basic form of it... Now, if you read the Bible, if you're a biblical Christian, you'd expect it right away. In Exodus, uh, it says that Jehovah appeared in the daytime as a pillar of smoke and at night as a whirlwind of fire. Literally, it's in the Bible. And when Moses saw the burning bush, it looked like that. It was a word. A lot of seers have tried to paint pictures of what uh, what a human being looks like in the in, in the depths of meditation, awake to self. It seemed like a, it seemed like a bush or like a spiral of fire with the, with the cup, uh, flower-like cup at this part of the upper part of the aura. In fact, if you look at the description of leaving the body in a cosmic conception, it talks about the experience is a spiraling in several directions at the same time. It's, it's much more complex than that. And we know that Elisha, in talking to God, was caught up in a whirlwind. Or Job, in his tribulations, God spoke to Job out of a whirlwind. So it's not, it's not, such, it's not so far-fetched as, uh, as all that, that the form of that experience. Well, I want to use the form or the picture for another purpose. If we see self as a fiery whirlpool, the form of it, not the real nature of it, because I, I, I would be folly for me to stand here and say that I was talking to a, a bunch of fiery whirlpools because obviously the spiritual intelligence is much is much more than that. It's an image. It's a, it's a uh, it's an image that is there for a purpose, and that purpose is what we're trying to get to: birth in Christ. We can ask ourselves then, where does Christ fit into this picture? We remember that this swirl is in a fluidic something and that something is and flows through it. It's even more subtle than water. Both of those somethings are life spirit. Both of those somethings are Christ. In this context, then, this is a very dangerous thing. Again, we're looking at pictures. 
we might say that the life spirit is an ocean of light, an ocean of light of intelligence, such as when we make a discovery and the lights go on and we say, ah, I know the truth. An ocean of that life, like when we say, oh, I understand the purpose of life. Or when we say, oh, life is so wonderful because it's, that's the only feeling that's capable of bearing all of experience in it is the feeling of life. Or life, when we say, um, I got to to carry on, I guess. In that ocean, the very, in the same way that the physical ocean is the mother of life and forms of life, there is something about the nurturing, about the infusing quality of the life in that ocean of Christ that we will to create our own little vortices like we define ourselves and we define ourselves now do you see what I'm trying to say this, uh, this definition we can now see we said that the vacuum that is inside the archetypes of concrete thoughts was like a question like we were asking a question and the question that we're asking here that is in the sucking center of this vortex that is the higher self is what am I? Who am I? You know, the, the, the question of Oedipus, who am I? The answer was a human. You know, the answer to the riddle of the Sphinx was it's, I am a human. It had the one, two, three in it. What walks on uh, 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 two, three, four in it? What walks on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three in the evening? Uh, there's, another, there's a deeper meaning to it than that, but we, that would really be a side trip. But this vortex is our continued consciousness continuously asking and filling with meaning and answers. It is this vortex that draws together all of the personality and that motivates it and that again draws out and uh, you might say sucks and demands of us experience. God wants us to burn, wants us to uh, impact with the world. And so that, all right, so that is what we're trying to get at. The, the gestation of the self is the formation, we might say, in our visual image of this vortex. And the deeper this vortex becomes and the more defined it is and the more it has character, the more we are ready to be born in it. Then, the process of birth in Christ is a very simple process. It's a process of instead of looking at our own empty little worlds and instead of looking at things from our vortex, if we shift our axis of reference to the sea of life, that is what being born in Christ is. This is a really beautiful thing. This is, mind you again, this is a dangerous image. But it's beautiful because in the shifting of the reference, the self doesn't go away, the personality doesn't go away. It's just that we look at things from a totally different point of view. We look at things from the viewpoint of life that everybody shares. We are indeed living in the stuff of altruism. You can't practice altruism when you once experience the Christ consciousness, it's natural to you. There's no practice to it. You can't do anything but love. And when in that, from this point of view, it's just a change of reference. And you don't even have to lose any of the consciousness of the self. It's just that you live in a world that we all share. And you can, it's, 
we're, we're all then of the same stuff. We're not, we're not different. You know you what, I, what I'm trying to say? Something like this is the beginning of what it is like to be born in self. Now this is, from an intellectual point of view, this is a really important thing. So this, this says that the Jesus people are right when they say you have to give your life to Christ. Literally, this is the process of giving your life to Christ. It's saying, what would Christ do in this circumstance? Or it's saying, how is the other person going to feel uh, about, about my deeds or about my actions? It can be accomplished in very, very simple ways. But the thing is, is that we just shift our axis and we don't look as, you know, it's exactly like our temple service says, we don't look on our own things, we look on the things of others. We're looking from the ocean point of view and not from the eddy point of view. It's a, you know, because this is a big problem in all spiritual philosophy and even uh, non-spiritual philosophy in terms of psychology. The problem of self is a big problem. Some people believe that self is an illusion and therefore you destroy it. And some people even deny that self exists. And some people try to bypass self. In this way, you, you see, love needs something to love. And it needs vehicles to love through. And if we destroy the eddy, there is no expression for love. And so we can't destroy the self. We can't just try to, you know, we just can't try to let it dissolve and, and go into bliss. We're not serving anything that way. Some people have tried to turn themselves, the self over to a master, but that's not the same thing. It has to go the only way that we can get around the problem of self, because it's always, you know, when you're looking from the viewpoint of self, no matter how fair you try to be, you're still looking from the viewpoint of self. But when you shift the consciousness to selfness, when you shift the consciousness to the ocean of Christ, you can't do anything but be fair. You can't do anything but be just or but be right. Okay. This, we've looked a little bit about birth in Christ. We're going to carry this a little bit further tomorrow when we talk about uh, giving. And then we're going to talk about forgiving. Because uh, we, uh, you know, if there's anything, you know, we talk about so much profane stuff. And uh, I'm really so thankful to be out here to be able to spend uh, just about two weeks' time talking about the loftiest things that I can talk about. I realize it's, I'm going to have to pay mightily for it being daring enough to talk about it, but uh, we just have to do it. Now, we have one little matter to talk about yet, and that is the birth of Christ. Not the birth of us in Christ, but the birth of Christ in us. Because this is a matter that is misconstrued by a lot of Christians. It is an issue of acceptance of Christ into our lives without abrogating any of our responsibility. We don't lose our responsibility. We don't forego it. It's true that everything we have in our personal life, if we give it over to Christ, when Christ is born, in us, it's given back to us. No, nothing is ever lost. So we have to talk a little bit about Christ. Christ needs us. Those are literally the statements of uh, that wonderful man. Have you ever read Meister Eckhart? He said things like, uh, I see a God with the same eye that God sees me. And that eye is like, oh, the whirlpool is like an eye. If you look at a galaxy, it's nothing but a big uh, whirlpool like that of fire. I shouldn't say nothing but a big whirlpool of fire. How profane. But, uh, but uh, Meister Eckhart very clearly said, God needs me as much as I need God. Because the universal 
by the fullness of its love. There's something about the character of Christ that it has to create and that it has to love. But in order to have that ability to express and be the living love, the feeling of the cosmos, which the life spirit is, it can't do the personal things that we do. So Christ needs us to love. If there's anything, you know, it's very easy to get involved with spiritual things and have an expanded consciousness before we're really ready for it. You know what happens when that happens? What happens in the consciousness? Something like existentialism. Back in the 60s, I would see all of these people that would take acid trips. And they'd come and they'd start talking about their spiritual life. And if you press them, they would say, oh, it's all just a big game. Just exactly like the existentialist philosophers, they thought life was a great big game because they had, in a way, forced open a kind of higher consciousness before the soul was enriched and before they had gone through the gestation of the self and the Christ within. And it was wide open to them, but they didn't understand the purpose. If we see people uh, if we see people that are artists or even fanatics that have some great purpose that they live for, you know, I, I see people that are really high minded people and I see they have purpose ever so much more it must be when we think of divine beings like Christ, all of the purpose that must be there. This love that is Christ is continuously renewed. It is continuously reborn. And we are the foci of that love. Christ wants us to be born in Christ. And Christ wants to be born in us. And if this sounds very churchy, and I don't make any apologies about that, because that's the way it is. Because the Spirit is, there is as much of a longing of the Spirit to love as we have a longing for love. Having Christ born in our life is probably one of the simplest things things that we can do. It's a very, very simple phenomenon. All we have to do is remember. The communion with Christ, where we take the body and blood of Christ, is said, this do in remembrance of me. All we have to do is remember that life. It's, it's one of the hardest things and the easiest things to do at the same time. But uh, it is just remembering to do it. And then we can see it into, exi into existence. I know it's hard because I sometimes get at loggerheads with people and go face to face with them. But you know, you can do it. You can love. Uh, I, 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 you know, this, there is something, each of these experiences, being born in Christ and having Christ born in us is something that we can have similes in our lives. I picture being born in Christ sort of like learning how to do a float when you swim. Because you know how you thrash around and you're afraid and the water is going to you know, is, is going to overwhelm you and then finally you relax and I'm skinny, I'm the mystical type if I lay on my back in fresh water all that sticks out are just the tips of my larger toes and this much of my face and it took me a long time to just have faith and relax and you know, the feeling you're alright 
and the fear of losing self. We're never afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of losing the known. And when we let go and float and trust like in that sea of love, that's what being born in Christ is like. Having Christ born in us is something a little different. We can't command it, but we can invite it. This brings out another side of that vacuum. First we saw the vacuum as a questioning, but now we see the vacuum as an inviting. We can't demand that Christ comes into our life. Christ will not interfere in any which way with our freedom, but we can ask Christ into our lives and we can invite Christ into our lives and we can do it in such a way that Christ wants to be in our lives. You don't want to go to somewhere where you're not wanted and where people are where where your living will not be appreciated, will not be loved. And the more we can have our consciousness so that we are inviting to Christ, and the more we can have our consciousness so that Christ would want to be working in and through us is uh, is what it's like. At least it is for me. For me, I understand it's a very, very slow, slow process. I have a picture in my consciousness, and I've had it for some years now, that uh, somewhere deep down in my consciousness, there's a spring, a very, very pure, wholesome water. And gradually, year by year, it's making its way to the surface. But as it does so, it has to push layer after layer of merd. And each layer of merd that gets pushed up seems more uh, rotten than the ones before. But occasionally, a little bit of moisture gets to the surface. And occasionally, a drop gets to the surface. And it's wonderfully, wonderfully healing, not only to me, but to anyone. Because we all want to be useful. We all want to be helpful in the world. And that's what this that's sort of the way the experience goes for me. Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born and not within thyself thy soul will be forlorn. So we know a little bit now about being born in Christ and a little bit about Christ being born in us. And a beautiful thing about this too is that Christ is the quietest of all guests in us. That the only impedition or the only interference or the only friction comes from us. We can, I don't know how we can say it, like right in everything we do, right in our consciousness, Christ can be in that. And other people can sense it and they can be healed by it. And, you know, it can be right in us. And it doesn't in any which way interfere with what we are. It, you know what I mean? We're, we don't. Nothing is lost in Christ, and uh, we don't. It's 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 a win-win situation, as they say in uh, the stock market, that you have you can't do anything but win. And it, I, I well, I've probably said enough. Somebody should probably take a gun and shoot me. Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born and not within thyself, thy soul will be forlorn. Tomorrow we'll talk about giving.